refused to allow them to move into that community, right? And so our history, our legacy of racialized violence, of racism runs deep, and it has created the, the, um, the communities and the neighborhoods that we see today. And so what I often say, there's this really good documentary, if you have time to watch it, it's called Segregated by Design. It's based on this book, The Color of Law. Um, so what we see in our city is not by accident, it's by design. And we have to wrestle with that structural, those structural factors in order to really, really t uh, uh, have an impact on residential segregation in, in this country. So we get to 1968. Um, we actually have you know, protests and social movement that happens. And we, we signed the Fair Housing Act of 1968, actually just about a week after Martin Luther King was assassinated. This was like a, a way of kind of saying, oh, well, we need to move forward on this. Lyndon B. Johnson signs the Fair Housing Act of 1968. And so this says that there should be no discrimination when it comes to housing policy in the United States. However, 50 years later, we see in data, um, this is data from the 2010-2014 American Community Survey, that we're still very separate and unequal in this country, again. So the other thing about racism, and the other thing about structural racism, is it finds a way to recreate itself. So now we may not, we have laws that prevent, or that say you can't discriminate based on you know, race and other um, social uh, strata, but we find ways to discriminate, whether it's through loaning, through the bank loans that we get, et cetera, and we, again, recreate these structures of inequality that exist in, our, um, in the United States. And so we know all of the harmful exposures that are related to this, um, things like uh, and limited access to healthy foods, limited opportunities for jobs, et cetera, exposure to harmful toxins, all of these concentrate in the neighborhoods in which we live. And I've been doing so at Drexel, I've got the Urban Health Collaborative, and I've been doing a course, um, an online course actually, entitled Urban Inequalities in Health. And for this course, what I decided to do was to film in different parts of the city to show and demonstrate different forms of urban inequality. So have a, a segment on residential segregation, have a segment on gentrification. And this past week, we were in West Philly, we were in North Philly, we were you know, all over Philadelphia, and it was very sobering, right, to travel through Philadelphia, you know, four or five you know, miles apart, and being literally in two different worlds. So where I sit in West Philadelphia at Drexel University, you have all the amenities, all, you know, all the things needed to lead a, a healthy life. Literally go 10, 15 minutes up to North Philadelphia, and you're in a whole different world, right? And we've actually just now recently done a study in Philadelphia where we show life expectancy based on the different areas in the city where there's about a 20 year difference in life expectancy for men in North Philly versus men in the center of the city. 20 year life expectancy different in the same city. And it's because we've created these, 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 these environments, these neighborhoods not because of personal preference, but because of policy. And that's where we have to move our conversation when we're talking about how racism really literally becomes a body. And so some of my work has been in the Jackson Heart Study, which started in 2000. Um, in 2003, actually, Sharon Wyatt and some others actually talked about how the Jackson Heart Study was really designed in order to, to uh, examine the issue of racism and health. And so it was not just to look at kind of biological markers. It was not designed you know, to look at genetic markers. It was really the, the folks who were at the table, folks like Sherman James and others, really thought of it as a good opportunity to examine racism and how that influences cardiovascular disease in African Americans in the Deep South, right? And so I think it's really important to have that history. And so I've been doing some work in the Jackson Heart Study. This is just from one of the analyses that we've done looking at measures of residential segregation, high and low, and cardiovascular disease incidents across the study. And what we found fine within a, a sample of African Americans is that racial, racial, you have a twofold difference in cardiovascular disease incidents across these neighborhoods. And this is within African Americans. So seeing this heterogeneity within African Americans suggests to me that it's not race, but racism that is driving this. And that if, you, if we change the environment, we can actually change the outcomes, right? And so this is a really, I think, clear example of how this is operating here. But racism is global, 
right? And I think that, I think as we're, we're, we, we talk about the 1619 Project and what it's meant for us to reflect on 400 years, we cannot, in the United States, be US-centric in our conversation. And I see my mentor, uh, Giselle, who walked in earlier, she was just in Brazil. I'm sure she saw something. She was like, hey, where did all these black people come from? <laughs> Right, exactly. And so one of the things that I'm pushing in my work is that we have to have a global perspective of racism and recognize that the U.S. isn't even the place in the world that has the largest African um, descendant population outside of the continent, right? And so I think it's important, yes, to think about structural racism as something that is um, a part of the U.S. kind of fabric, but really structural racism and really white supremacy is a global enterprise. And as a global enterprise, we can see the ways in which it manifests in different racialized societies. And in fact, the uh, Pan American Health Organization is also beginning to kind of wake up to this, although folks have been saying this for years. And they list the history and legacies, legacy, excuse me, of ongoing colonialism and structural racism as a key driver of health and health inequalities. And this is this is new. And I, I met with someone from the Pan American Health Organization a couple of weeks ago, about a month or two ago, and she said it was really folks from the Caribbean and from Colombia who black African American, or excuse me, black um, 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 academics who really pushed this language in this report um, because we have to again have this recognition that these are the real structural drivers of racial inequalities in health. So I'm really glad to see that in this 2000, this very recent report by the Pan American Health Organization, we do see this um, as being really important. And again, they have some recommendations around what we need to be doing in terms of structural racism. And so like I said, I've been doing for the past couple of years work in Brazil. Um, and I think that it's really important um, to kind of juxtapose these two settings because I've actually been able to see some of the very the similarities in these settings, but also some of the differences um, so just, you know, so you know, Brazil's history is rooted in the legacy of, of slavery. It actually uh, had enslaved uh, Africans before 16, uh, 1619. It was actually in the 1500s where Portuguese colonizers took uh, Western Central African slaves uh, to, the, uh, to South America. They imported 10 times more, 10 times more uh, Western Central Africans over their 10 year, 30 uh, year, 300 year period history in the country. And Brazil actually has the largest African descendant population outside of the continent, right? And so, you know, we have, I think it's about 12% here in the United States. I'm gonna do a little guessing game. How many of you all think it's about 20% in Brazil? 20%? 30%? 20% black. 30%, I mean black, black or African descendant. So 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%, 60%. So in the 2010 census, if you combine black and cargo or mixed race, it's 50 or a little bit over 50%. So over half their population is black. And it has this legacy of racism and oppression um, in Brazil, despite the fact that they say they're a racial democracy. And we can talk a little bit about what that means in that context. And so in, um, in June of this year, actually myself, Zinzi, Dr. Zinzi Bailey and Dr. Chandra Ford, did a really nice panel at SER on um, bringing kind of critical race theory into the conversation around epidemiology. And one of the, re the reasons this was so important, especially as I tied in the work in Brazil, is that you have to think about racialization that happens in these contexts, right? And so in the United States, we have this one drop rule, right? That was, you know, a, 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 this idea of separation. So we keep the race is separated, then we can maintain kind of racial dominance and white supremacy in our country, and maybe they'll die out eventually, right? That was kind of the thinking behind keeping kind of the races separate. But in Brazil, what you have is miscegenation, right? This mixing um, in the population, but it was still based on white supremacy. So the idea was if we mix the, you know, the races enough, then it'll kind of dilute you know, blackness in this con this context, right? Obviously, that hasn't happened, but again, that racialization process is really important. Um, one, because it creates different uh, continuum um, of skin colors and, and kind of and, and categories of skin tone in that context, but also 
you can have a myth of racial dem democracy, but again, underlying, you'll see the structural inequalities that exist along these, this racial continuum, right? But understanding that is really important if you're wanting to understand how racism becomes embodied in this context. And so I read some of uh, Dr. Edward Tellis's work, Race in Another America, because it really gives a nice context for how this happened in Brazil. Um, and then Maria de Franco, she says, uh, to speak of race is to speak of uh, excuse me, the domination and enslavement of a people, of the erasure, silencing, and withdrawal of their humanity. To talk about race is to talk about the inequality that structures our society to this day. Again, it's not about these biological differences. It's not about these genetic differences. It is really about how our society has structured um, inequalities um, based on race in our, in, 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 in around the world. And so in Brazil, again, because you have this dominant narrative of, of, of racial democracy, you actually have many of the activists and even scholars you know, saying, we can show you with the data that racism is not an opinion, right? And so this is really important um, to note because scholars you know, go to the data to show you know, the differentiation, uh, the differences that exist by income, the differences that exist um, in terms of uh, police violence. For example, there's one statistic that says that every 23 minutes in Brazil, a young black person is killed, right? And t typically this is at the hands of police. And so again, there's all these statistics to suggest that though you might say that there's, you know, this racism doesn't exist, the structures say and the data says otherwise. And so if you look at, for example, income um, by race in, a, um, in Brazil, and actually compared to the United States, there are wider gaps in terms of income inequality in Brazil compared to the United States. And this income inequality then maps out ge geographically, and we see it show up in racial residential segregation. And so this is actually a dot density map of class or um, income in the south zone of Rio. And what you see here um, in the dark purple shaded areas are areas where there's predominantly or con high concentrations of poor. And if you look at the same dot density map but look at race, you see that there's, they're literally a mirror image of one another, right? And again, this demonstrates kind of the kind of the ways in which social inequality shows up spatially in this context. So I go to Brazil often, about once or twice a year, and this is the train that I get on, right? And in the context of Brazil, you know, is there anything that that stands out to you about this train and the advertising on this train, right? You got black folks on one side, white folks on the other, and everybody's happy, right? This is how it's, no, that, this is how it's supposed to be, right? But this actually literally um, is, is how it is. And so when I travel, um, I literally stay in the south zone of Rio. I travel to the north zone of Rio, which is where the National School of Public Health is. Um, and I actually see this play out very visibly. Um, and so and in terms of the, not just in terms of demographics, but also in terms of kind of the infrastructure. So you have your nice, you know, areas of beaches and you can see Cristo and all these things, again, in the South Zone of Rio. And then when I step off the train, literally 30 minutes, this is where I am, in the North Zone, in the Menino's favela, which is the largest favela in Rio, right? So again, these spatial, these kind of economic and social inequalities playing out spatially in this context, um, again, demonstrating very vividly um, and in, uh, in a very visible way that structural racism really um, matters in this context. But I'm not the first to discover this. Um, actually, Leila Gonzalez was an Afro-Brazilian anthropologist, a black feminist who actually coined intersectionality. So we think it originated here, but Leila Gonzalez is an anthropologist who who really was talking about this in the 70s. And she says, she has this to say, from the colonial period to the present day, one perceives an evident separation as to the physical space occupied by dominators and dominated. The natural place of the dominant white group are healthy dwellings, located in the most beautiful places of the city or the countryside, and the duly protected by different forms of policing ranging from overseers to skippers, et cetera, to the formerly full, um, foreign police. From the big house to the beautiful buildings and homes of today, the criterion has been the same. On the other hand, the natural place of the Negro is the opposite, of course. From the slave quarters to the favelas, the criterion has been the same, the racial division of space, 
In the case of the dominated group, what is ver uh, verified are entire families huddled in cubicles whose hygiene and health uh, conditions are the most precarious. In addition, there's also police presence here, only that it is not to protect, but to repress, to violate, and to frighten. That is why it is understood that the other natural place of the Negro are prisons. The systematic police repression given its racist, racist nature has at its objective the establishment of submission. All right? So doesn't this ring true for what we experience right here in the United States? Again, this idea that racism and structural racism is a global enterprise has been documented for years, and it has huge implications for our health. And so, um, not to be morbid again, um, but in April of 2000, earlier this year, I was actually in Rio um, giving a talk at the, um, with some Swedish and Brazilian scholars and got off the plane to the news that a, a gentleman, um, was, I think he was in his 30s or 40s, was riding with his family, um, his young son and his wife. They were going to a baby shower. And right now in Rio, what you have is